Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie, host and head bookologist here at the Get Literate Podcast. I'm a book-loving, notebook-hoarding reader and writer on a mission to change lives one book and one notebook at a time. On this podcast, we explore the power of bookology and leading literate lives. We talk all things books and reading and notebooks and writing mixed in with mindful practices and creativity to create lives we love. You can expect regular weekly episodes focused on three books you need to know about on a bookish theme and how to bring those themes to life in our actual lives too. You can also expect author interviews, notebooking inspiration, and topics to help us grow through what we go through and take inspired action to make our lives better. So grab a notebook and your TBR list and let's get literate. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Get Literate and the Kid Lit Love podcasts. I'm Stephanie, and this podcast episode needs a bit of an introduction, because if you're listening to Get Literate, I'm here on Tuesday on an ordinary episode bringing this to you. But if you're a Kid Lit Love listener, then this is a bonus episode this summer, because we might have a little bit more time for some extra reading and writing. Now, regardless of which podcast you're listening from, you know that I love books and reading and notebooks and writing. I feel like a kid on Christmas morning every time I get to talk to an author, explore their backstory, and my favorite part, get a sneak peek into their process of writing a book. And every single time, I walk away in awe of the passion, the energy, and the love that they have for the work of writing. Not just the actual writing, but the reading, the research, the exploring, the connecting, all of it just feels magical. And you know what? I really, really want that. (laughs) I want to feel it too. And yes, you might be wondering if you know me well, that I've already written a couple of books, but those are professional development books for teachers. And there is a dream in the back of my heart to write Kidlet. Here's what I've learned, though, over the course of many conversations with authors. The secret, I have figured out a secret. The secret to being a writer, an author, whose days are filled with writing and all of those bookish joys that I mentioned, the secret is this. We can all feel it, literally right now. Because the only thing standing in our way of feeling like this is writing. Not the publishing, that's really great, and I hope to get there, but I've learned it's the process of actually doing the writing and doing the so-called work that feels so good. And we can decide to do that whenever we want to. And that's why today I am so excited to talk to two guests who are helping me to bring my writerly life to life in the way that I want it. Victoria Coe and Cheryl Lawton Malone are both here, two children's literature authors who have teamed up to help others bring their own kidlit dreams to life. So if you have a dream in the back of your head or your heart, like I do, to write children's literature, then this episode is for you. That was a really long introduction, but Cheryl and Victoria, welcome to both the kidlit love and the Get Literate podcast. I am so glad that both of you are here. Oh, well, double thanks (laughs) for this great opportunity to connect with you and all of your listeners. Absolutely. We're thrilled to be here. Yeah. And you can hear it in my voice. I already am. I'm like, I'm going to lose my breath. I'm so excited to talk to these two today. (laughs) Even even though I, I want to dig into right away the, the, the kid that writing and, and that aspect of your work together, I would love for you both to just spend a couple of minutes introducing yourself, your work, your books, your both published children's literature authors who are now teaming up together in this new adventure. But why don't we start with you, Victoria? Give give us a little backstory on your journey to being a, a kid lit author. Oh, thank you, Stephanie. Um, And I also want to say as a listener myself of your podcast, it's extra fun to be here. Um, So 
I didn't always want to be an author. Um, in fact, when I was growing up, I didn't consider myself a reader and I also hated writing. Um, but it was only as I got older and looked back that I realized that I was a reader. It was that I told myself I wasn't because I didn't read as many books as the other kids. And I also didn't read as quickly as they did. And I didn't always read a book that was considered to be at my level. I read what I liked. And it was only as I got older that I realized that those characters from the books that I loved had stayed with me and that they had stayed in my heart. And as I became a mother, I had a different career um, and I was a mother reading to my own children. And I know a lot of your listeners will be able to relate to this, uh, whether reading in a classroom or reading in a family setting. Um, I, re I realized how important those characters had been to me in my life and, and that they really had never left me. And I started to realize that the books that I was reading to my own children would stay with them. And those characters would become part of their lives. They weren't just stories. They weren't just books, you know? And I started to realize like, what could be more important than that? You know, giving and, you know, sharing some of yourself and, and becoming some a part of someone's life, not to mention the joy of reading. And for me, it was the family setting of reading. And I really wanted to write a book that other families would read as a as a group or um, I never dreamed I didn't know that classroom read alouds were a thing because I don't think that really happened with my own kids although my own fifth grade teacher read the trumpet of the swan to us and I of course still remember it um, so it turns out um, that my journey took me an extremely long time um, I started you know with that spark and that 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 love in my heart, but what would what would I write? You know, the kind of book I would want to read. But um, it turns out that it was a lot harder than I thought it would be to get started. And while I love animals, and I particularly love animal point of view characters like Ribsy or Ralph S. Mouse or a lot of those classic characters, I thought it would be too hard to write from an animal's perspective. And actually it was. So I never even tried it. I tried writing books from humans points of view and I joined SCBWI and the writing groups and I went to writing conferences and I took classes online and I read books about writing and, and all of it was very helpful. And I, I kept writing and getting better and better and better, but none of the things that I had written were good enough to really break through to that level that I wanted to be. And it was probably 10 years or maybe even more of that, that I decided to really go for it. And I considered an MFA program because um, I really wanted to go for it. But and in the end, I decided that I really just wanted the mentoring part. So I actually worked one-on-one -on -one with a mentor who was on staff at Simmons, where um, there's a great MFA program here in Boston. And she mentored me for a year in a really intensive personalized program um, and the summer after that year was when I got the idea for Fenway and Hattie. She was unable to help me with it, unfortunately. She had she was on medical leave then, um, and she ultimately passed away, which is really, really tragic. But I wrote Fenway and Hattie with her on my shoulder. I felt like she had given me a lot of tools. And so it was still very, very hard to write that story from the dog's perspective. And it took me about two years to get that story. Um, it's a middle grade story. Um, but then it, I finally got it. And um, so my agent sold it right away to Putnam. It became a series. It spawned another series. I wrote a different middle grade in between those two. And now I have nine books and you know all kinds of accolades that I never expected. And turns out that Fenway and Hattie is like the most popular read aloud and is an all community read in schools like every year. It never ceases to amaze. So that's my story. I love it. And, and I, lo I love a couple of things about it. Um, but I love when you said you just decided to go for it. You had the moment where you just decided, okay, I'm all in. And then look, look what happened, right? No matter how much time had passed, look, look what happened. And, you know, you said early on when you first started, um, there is just something magical about children's literature. And I don't know if you are or both of you are big movie buffs, but one of my favorite movies is You've Got Mail, the one with Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks. And of course, Kathleen Kelly in the movie um, is a bookseller with a shop around the corner. And I'm not going to get the quote right, but she says something in that movie 
of how reading a book in your childhood has an impact on you like no other time in your life can. And as an educator, as a reader, as a parent, I could, I just see it and I feel it. And I'm so grateful that authors like you had that moment, you know, where, where you kept going and, and put pen to paper because the experiences between caregivers and kids, adults and kids, teachers and kids, it's just magical when you have a book like that. And I'm not surprised that Fenway and Hattie has just gone, gone big and in that way. So, oh, I just loved it. Thank you. Cheryl, how about you? Tell us about your journey. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, you know, it it, it coincides with uh, Vicky's, Victoria. Um, I call her Vicky because she's one of my best friends, um, both professionally and personally. Um, but we, we started out maybe uh, not quite the same. I read from early on, I was an avid reader, never occurred to me to be a writer, um, but I did read everything I could get my hands on. In fact, I remember being not being allowed into my brother's room and sneaking in so that I could read the history of the world textbook that he had on his shelf. So I wasn't, I, I just, I just loved reading. It transported me. Um, my family traveled, uh, moved a lot. And so reading um, and my dog books and, and my dog were my friend in many, many places that where I, before I made new friends, uh, you know, when you move around you, it's a, it's almost like a security blanket. So I did have that. Um, but as you know, as I got older and, you know, went to high school and university, um, I, you know, I, I just thought about a career, what I wanted to do. So I became an attorney and um, I did that for 25 years. I was a biotech attorney, um, not really thinking about writing, let alone writing for children. I was writing every day. Um, and I got to a point where um, I felt like I really, even though it took a ton of creativity to do my job, it wasn't the kind of creativity that touches your soul. You know, I, I could make something up in a contract. I could figure out a new way to do a licensing agreement. I could bring on employees. I could change a company. Um, but I, you know, you're not really telling the stories of your soul. And so um, I thought about that. I started to think very actively about how to become a writer. And, um, you know, that's where our paths uh, not only physically overlap, but sort of uh, figuratively overlap as well, because it turns out it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, but I did do an MFA program um, for the very reason that Vicki said, which is, you know, I was, wanted to go all in. Mm -hmm. I did it while I was working. Um, but then at the end of it, uh, at the end of the MFA program, um, and I'll just digress there for two seconds because you talked about the love of uh, the relationship between uh, caregivers and and children and the the magic of characters that stay with people with their with children and then through your whole lives. There is nothing more um, uh, solid about that than picture books. That is the actual entry point mm -hmm. of a, a child into the reading world. And uh, the magic of it is that a picture book is intended to be read while sitting on someone's lap or sitting in front of them. And so there's this personal connection that happens with picture books that doesn't happen with any other form of literature. Yeah. And that is why I've ended up in that field. Um, I thought I was going to be, I went through this MFA program and I thought I was going to be a, a YA writer. And I thought, you know, my kids are just barely out of high school. I know all the lingo. I can, I can emulate the feelings. I can create 3D characters. And it wasn't until um, post graduation from the MFA program, uh, I ended up with a. I ended up leaving the law and teaching. I got a job at Leslie University teaching writing for children um, because I had this MFA. I figured I better do something with it. Um, and through that, you know, I, I was going through that and interacting with students and coming up with syllabus and syllabi and um, you know coming then working on my own writing. It wasn't until I took a retreat uh, and went down to the Cape that, and, and I'm writing all the time, writing this, you know, YA novel and write YA stories and thinking that I'm really connecting and I'm not really connecting because I'm not really getting any response, but I'm learning. I joined SCBWI. I go to conferences. I took a million classes. That is when uh, Victi and I met up. We were in the same writing group and we connected immediately. Um, but then I went down to the Cape for this writing retreat um, and in Provincetown. And uh, on the very last day, happened to be in April, 
uh, the right whales migrate through P-Town, that area of the of Cape Cod in uh, Massachusetts, and they're heading north to uh, Canada. And uh, you could see the whales from the shore. So that's how close they come in. And I was there with my dog walking along on the beach. And sure enough, a whale swims right up to the shore, 15, 20 feet away, um, and uh, spouts. And, and, and my dog, is, you know, we're startled. The reason they get so close is because there's a huge drop off there. But uh, my dog is startled. I'm startled. My dog barks. The whale lifts its head out of the water and looks at us. And like, <laughs> that was just a magical moment, right? So I have all my legal background, all my legal experience, you know, all my YA writing and studying. And um, I had this incredible experience. And the only form that it, I really felt that I could convey it as a story was a picture book. It was a picture book. There was no, there was no question about it. And so the magic of that moment uh, <laughs> turned into Dario and the Whale. And that sort of, that's what launched my career as a picture book writer. But having gone through the academic study in the MFA program, it's the picture book courses that, that I was so fascinated with. And it's for the very reason that you said, it's this idea that you can create a character that is going to live in someone's mind for the rest of their lives. Yeah. It's just an amazing thing. You can touch somebody's heart with a character or a story that um, resonates with them. And, and, you know, the task that we then find ourselves with is how do you get that story that is resonating with you inside you onto a page in a form that's going to resonate with uh, an audience with with your readership. So um, that's that that's my, sort of my writing journey. I've been working on picture books since then. I do, of course, try other things. Um, I am just in love with the picture book um, genre. So um, and then following that, I don't you know. I think we're probably going to talk about it. But uh, Vicky and I decided. Vicky actually approached me with the idea that she was teaching too. Um, at the adult level. And uh, she's like, you know, we have all these years of teaching and all this experience with writing and publishing um, there. We, you know, we've, we've had some success. So let's, you know, let's see if we can help other people. Let's give back, let's pay it forward. And so that's how we started our, our company. And that's how we came up with the series, the writing uh, Kidlet 101 and 102 series. Which is a perfect segue. Thank you for that, <laughs> by the way. Um, so I was doing what I didn't realize would have been a, a writerly action, but one of the things that I love in both your books that eventually we'll talk about is that you have these call to actions. You give readers something that they could do literally right then in the very moment to take the next step forward into this dream of writing a book. And one of them is to kind of surround yourself with bookish people, with writerly people and that's actually how I found writing Kid Lit 101, which was a little detour on Twitter <laughs> and saw this bright, you know, this bright, beautiful, colorful book and thought writing Kid Lit 101. Well, hey, I've been wanting to write Kid Lit. I need a book, a self-paced journey, a self-paced course that can take me by the hand and walk me through it. And maybe, maybe this will, will be the book to do it. And I was lucky enough to see at the same time that by the time I found you writing Kid Lit 102 was also out. And so it came to me in this beautiful set, you know, package in, in the mail. And I've got to say, I, I've said it before we were recording. I teach children's literature at the university level. I get to talk to lots of authors. I've read, I don't even know how many blog posts about writing your first book. I've watched YouTube videos. I've listened to podcasts. It wasn't until your book, Writing Kid Lit 101 and Writing Kid Lit 102, because I read them one right after the other the first time as fast as I could. It wow. wasn't until your book and your voices that were so friendly yet so nudgy, <laughs> that, if that's a word that I can use, <laughs> that I actually wrote the crappy first draft. And, and I say, you know, I say that with a smile because you're very clear in your book. Like you just got to write it. It's not going to be good. You, you just have to get it out and you'll just, you'll feel it. Like when you do that, you just feel that sense of accomplishment. And I, I know, I know I would not have gotten out that first draft without feeling like the two of you were, were one on each of my shoulder in this very readable, just friendly, 
come take my hand and let me show you what's possible kind of way. So I just want to start by saying a huge thank you because I feel inside now like, gosh, darn it. I am a writer. I, I could be a writer. I, I could do this, whether it's ever published or not. I've realized in my heart, that's not the point, although that would be pretty awesome. But it's just that feeling to know that you're capable of getting something down in a draft like that. Thank you both. Like, I just got to start there. Thank you both for teaming up and doing this. Oh my gosh, you're making our hearts so happy. <laughs> exactly well, good, we good. Wanted. I need to return the favor somehow. You know, Cheryl Cheryl didn't go into any detail, but I'll just give you a little taste. You know, Cheryl and I were in this in-person writing group together in the Boston area. And Cheryl was the person I connected with in that group. And I was just like honored that Cheryl even wanted to sort of like connect with me outside of the group because Cheryl is so savvy and talented and smart and she knows how to teach and she knows her stuff not to mention she's an incredible writer herself and um we just found ourselves you know outside of the group you know just talking shop you know talking craft you know and then we would bounce ideas off of each other and Cheryl quickly became not only a close friend there's no bond like kidlet kidlet people bonding as you know sure. um and she became the person that I would brainstorm with and send all my ideas. And if I got stuck and she just, oh, she's so great. And so that's how, and she was also teaching. I was teaching an in-person class in the evenings here in Cambridge, Mass. And um, it was, I loved, and I had to stop doing it after three years because, you know, that was when Fenway and Hattie was coming out. And, you know, it, my requests for school visits were just, you know, really exploding. And I couldn't be in Cambridge every Monday night. You know, I, I was saying no to schools, which was ridiculous. So um, I had to give it up, but it was with a heavy heart. And then years later, but Cheryl and I, you know, we became each other's go-to person. And, you know, we went through many, many books together and, you know, celebrated each other's success, et cetera. And then last, oh, I say last summer, right, Cheryl, but it was two summers ago. I just felt like this curriculum was sitting on my hard drive and, and I love teaching. And some of our students, I'm Cheryl, you know, didn't mention this, but, you know, one of her former students has gone on to become a Newbery Honor winner. And um, another one has successfully published many picture books. One of my former students um, has published since a picture book and a middle grade, which was a junior library guild selection. She had all these incredible reviews. I mean, she's awesome. So we knew our curriculum was good and we loved doing it. So we decided to see if we could write a book together. And as soon as we started the process of writing together, we knew we didn't want to just write another book. You know, we both had read a lot of books about writing and we wanted our book to be time, you know, of today, but we also wanted it to be something, you know, after the pandemic, people are, you know, accessing information in all different ways now. And we wanted something to be just super, super accessible. And we just thought nobody wants to just page through dry text, 300 words of, you know, academic language about, which is awesome. We're very nerdy. We love that stuff. But, you know, we just thought, wouldn't it be the most user-friendly thing in the world? And, you know, we knew who our audience was because we taught them. We had actual people in mind that we could say, we're writing for this person and this person and this person. And so what is her life like? You know, she has a full-time job. You know, maybe she has a family on top of her full-time job, but she's always wanted to write books. And she doesn't have time to go in person every Monday night to this class, but she has this dream in her heart and maybe she doesn't have enough money to sign up for an MFA program. I mean, who does really? And so that's who we wrote the book for. And so we had to think of how you know, how can we make it so that she just has, you know, let's get rid of all the excuses. You know, you're not just reading about how to do this. You're going to do it, you know, and we also know how to encourage people because it's another thing that we've done so many times and we're so good at it. And we encourage each other because let's face it, no matter who you are, you're, 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 writers all have psyches and we all need a push and, and not everyone is motivated in the same way. So when we try to write our exercises and our calls to action, we always give multiple choice because not everything is going to speak to everyone at the same time. And not everyone reacts to the same sort of stimulus. Some people are motivated by deadlines. Some people are motivated by rewards. Some people are motivated by a whole bunch of other things. And so 
that's how it began. And then, you know, we found our voice, our collective voice that you mentioned um, pretty easily because we wanted it to be very informal, very casual, very personable, just like if we were sitting around a table, you know, sharing and we wanted it to be, you know, like you said, fun and friendly. Fun and friendly. It definitely was. And um, I think you nailed the the audience, at least that you were writing for and me, right? Someone who wanted to do it, but was busy, who had kids, who also had a whole lot of excuses and who just felt the format of it was so conversational, right? Like I, I really felt like we were all just kind of sitting around a table, drinking a cup of coffee and you were just giving me the cliff notes down and dirty. I promise just do this kind of advice. And I'm glad you mentioned the ideas at the end because they felt so doable. You know, I have a couple of minutes. I could try that out. Or, you know, the the calls to action, I think, were my favorite because they were things I could do around writing as well as writing, because for me, the the writing, right? And I think based on what you both said for everybody, the writing sometimes can be the hardest part because of our own self-criticism <laughs> inside. So I felt like even if I wasn't writing, I was doing something that that was moving me in, in the right direction. And, and that's so totally. Though, what? No, I'm just, I was just going to, I'm sorry to jump in, but that's so totally consistent with being a writer, right? You don't sit down and just write. You have to read in your genre. You have to, um, you have to find mentor texts. If you don't, you're, you're wasting an opportunity and a mentor text for those who may not know is a book that's out there in your genre, whether you're writing for middle grade or YA or picture books um, or even adult, it's just something that's, it's similar to your book. Um, but that touches you, that you love something. That, and then, and there are techniques that you can use that you can copy. Not you don't copy the content, you copy the techniques. But if you don't, um, if you don't use those opportunities, then then you know they, they're they're part of how to be successful. You don't just writing is not the only is not the way to be successful. You're not that's not going to do it. Right. And right. And I also, found, oh yeah, I'm sorry to jump in too. But writing Kidlet 101, which is the first book we really wanted to teach the craft. We wanted to teach the readers how to build skills. So it's not just sitting down and writing once upon a time. It's like, how do you create a character? How do you build a world? How do you, you know, have a satisfying story problem stakes? You know, all of these things, antagonists, I mean, you know, all the, the, all of the uh, sections of the book, but skill building, you know, build your skills. And then when you write, you're going to have what you need. Yeah. So Kidlet 1 or Writing Kidlet 101 is this wonderful introduction. Like I said, it feels like it just kind of swoops you up and tells you that you can do this and, and gives you the ways to get started. But I've got to admit, it was Kidlet 102 that had me voice texting my, my writing buddy that I got because you told me to. So I was voice texting my writing buddy saying, or have you started it yet? Because you need to get to this chapter. I have to talk about this chapter. I felt like I was just, you know, that feeling I talked about at the beginning of the podcast that I see in the author's faces and voices when they get so excited. Kidlit 102, like, got me there. I was like, oh my goodness, all the things about turns and characters and pages and page breaks and end of the chapters. I was just so excited because you really, you gave such a, what's the word I want? I guess, an accessible view into the craft that even I felt like I could do, right? And I write nonfiction. I, I'm okay writing, you know, nonfiction for adult teachers, but this, I actually got into that book and thought, oh, this is how they do it. And I really felt like you were just releasing all your secrets. It's, it is, you know, honestly, it, it almost is a huge secret because, you know, I don't want to, I'm not bashing MFA programs. I certainly went to one and I loved my program. Um, but after, honestly, none of that was in there, was in that program because, you know, they, whatever, for whatever reason. So nobody had, you don't, you don't need an MFA today at all. But you do need to do the work to mm -hmm. learn how to write. You don't learn how to be a painter by just 
sitting down and starting to paint. You don't learn how to be a musician by just playing on the piano or whatever. You do need to spend the time, but it is those, the things that are in 102 are truly the things that made our courses magical. It's what made people come back to our courses. It's what I think prompted some of the people who were in our courses to go on and do really well. Um, it Those things are like, they're like gold. They're like little writing gold tidbits because they're all true. And, and what I think a lot of books and a lot of classes and um, um, you know institutions fail to tell you is that your job as a writer is to entertain and that's that's and for fiction you know nonfiction even create a nonfiction for kids little different but you it, there's a craft to telling a story the the oral version totally different craft writing fiction especially for children because it has to be simple straightforward and heartwarming uh you know um so there's a craft to it and that that is what the book captures and we went back and forth on the best way to present that material i uh, i think i had to be convinced uh not to go a different route and you know vicky was right as she always is about everything <laughs> Um, and uh, to put it in this particular format, we, this was maybe our third format uh, uh, presentation, the way we came up with presenting this book in this particular way, um, that, and we were finally happy with it um, and, and thought that it would be the accessible um, version that we wanted to bring out into the world. Yeah, um, yeah and for your, for your listeners who don't know, Writing Kidlet 102 is subtitled Your First Draft. So if writing Kidlet 101 is about skill building, um, writing 102 is about action. It's about getting it down on the page, you know, getting you to do it. And we actually wanted to cover some of that material originally in the first book, but we quickly realized that we didn't have enough room. Mm -hmm. So we decided to put it off and said, next year we'll write a second book. And of course, as Cheryl just mentioned, it was really hard to figure out how to present it, but we're both so thrilled with the way, I mean, as we were getting closer and closer to when we were revising it, we were like, this is it, this is it. We were so excited um, because, you know, there's so many different ways to write a first draft and it's, there's not just one way, you know, it, we hear pantsers, plotters, you know, a lot of people think, yo, just let it pour out of you, you know, right by the seat of your pants or plot out the whole story, outline it and then write it. And, but that's, those aren't the only two ways. If those work for you, great. But that's not the case with everyone. You know, somebody, some people need different ways. And the only way that matters is the way that works for you. And what works for me might not work for someone else, et cetera, et cetera. So we want it to be really empowering. I think writing 102 for us is all about empowerment. Um, we wanted to give lots of options, techniques, um, you know, methods, but also, and we don't have calls to action in that book, um, but we do have um, at the end of each section is what we call um, take a breath because we wanted to address the emotional, psychological part of being a writer because let's face it, so many writers sabotage ourselves. We get in our own way and it's so common. There are whole books just written about that, but we wanted to share and address some of those specific ways that that happens and the ways that we do that to ourselves so that we can overcome it. You know, we believe that if you set up a plan ahead of time, here's what I'm going to do if I get stuck. Here's what I'm going to do if I, you know, can't finish my draft. There's so many different things you can anticipate. If you come up with ideas of how you're going to handle it before it happens, you're setting yourself up for success because now you don't have to panic or wring your hands or just, you know, desert your writing for a while. You can go to your plan and get yourself stimulated again. Yeah. I really appreciated that. I am a big Seth Godin fan and mm -hmm. he has said, I, I don't know where, and I will probably butcher this quote too, but he asked you, you know, what's your dip? what is your dip going to be and what are you going to do when it gets here because it's going to get here whether it's writing a book or, or or whatever it is you have to have that plan now i found in, in the course of writing the first draft i really appreciated the different ways that both of you said that could happen and i actually found that i switched 
I switched back and forth um, during the process. So at first I thought, oh, I'm, I'm a planner. Like I've got to plot this out and I'm going to have the outline. And so I did make an outline. But then when I went to turn it into a draft, I realized I'm not really going to use that outline. I'm just going to write at the moment what I'm feeling. And then I got the idea because of one of your activities to kind of plot it out using index cards or sticky notes and put it all around the table. And so then my draft looked like that. And finally, what ended up working was looking at the outline and looking at the picture I took of my sticky notes and getting an old fashioned, you know, notebook and my mechanical pencil, a cup of coffee sitting in the parking lot of the coffee shop so that I wouldn't be interrupted. And I ended up writing it by hand and thought this was not how I thought this was going to go. And then I transferred it, of course, to a, a digital, a digital doc. And if I didn't, if I didn't hear from the two of you that all of that was okay, I could still get to the draft. I know I would have sabotaged myself and thinking, well, that's not the right way. That's not, that's not how, you know, kid that writers do it. And so I loved as part of the journey, just to getting the draft, I really love just thinking about the process. And I, I know from the book that you two are even more obsessed with the process, <laughs> you know, than I am. <laughs> so yeah. true. we, we love process. Um, it actually is the fun part, even though it's hard, it's the challenging part. It's the intellectual part, the creative part of writing. Um, it, you know, if you're one of the very lucky few people who can just think of something and write it down and it comes out of the story. I think Louisa May Alcott was probably the last person that I heard that did that successfully. Um, but um, it's it's all part of it. And the going forward and going backwards and trying new things, absolutely part of the process. Um, and also hopefully some of those take a breaths would let you know, will let the readers know, will let your listeners know that you're not the first one who's thought right. this. In fact, it's in a book because so many people deal with this issue and that issue and, and here are ways around it. That's the other thing. And those sections we do offer, you know, tips for gutting around uh, the things that are holding you back. But yeah, we love process. We, we especially like a uh, structure. I particularly like structure. Vicki is a huge, a character person. So um, if I, I always go to Vicki for character questions and for making sure your character, my characters are three dimensional. Um, she's amazing at that, but that all of that's in the book, in the two books. Yeah, and also we've lived it. Yeah, you know, I've been writing for twenty five years. You know, Cheryl's been writing for a very long time too. We've written so many. Each of us has written so many books, so many stories. We've gone through. <laughs> we know from our experience all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. and, and and now we as the reader get to learn from all that yeah. and each it allows each journey to be individual so that that's super important because you know as vicky said that there's just no one way to do this and there is no right way to do it there which means there's no wrong way to do it uh so the way that you do it as long as you end up with a draft right. that has more or less the right number of words uh doesn't have to be even close okay you could be off by whatever um, but as long as you get it down, you are being successful because that is truly how that's it's impossible to take the next step. You can't you can't refine. You can't lay your heart out into the page. Maybe your heart didn't make it into the page in this first draft. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because that's not what you're sending out to the world. Yeah. So the right way of doing it is the way that gets you to get writing on the paper. Well, absolutely. You could you couldn't have said it better. That's the message that may become our next tagline because that's the message of both books. That's yes, the message of the series. That's the message of right on productions. Yeah. So for someone listening whose you know interest is peaked and thought, okay, well, if Stephanie can write that first draft, I can write that first draft. What advice? I know your advice because I've I've read both of your books, but if you could just offer a piece of advice to a listener who who does have that dream in the back of their mind and has pushed it aside for whatever reason, what would you, what would you say to them as a way to begin? Do you want to start Cheryl? Sure. Um, so uh, if you have a dream in your heart, a story that you want to, in your heart that, and it, it, and it isn't even a story. It's if you have something you want, you want to 
you want to tell, you you feel like you have something to offer, even, even go one step further back the world, you know, that you should, you should just do it. And so that and there is, there are plenty of reasons not to, there's careers, there's kids, there's, you know, financial issues, there's timing issues, there's caretaking issues, there's every reason in the world not to. But unless you take that first step, unless you, maybe you buy the books first, but, or maybe you just start writing a single paragraph. If you had one story to tell your children or somebody you care about, what story would you tell? Mm -hmm. And just write that first paragraph and that will tell you a lot of information. That are you are do you sound like a child? Are you writing in a child's voice? Are you writing from a first person or a third person? Are you writing an adult story? Is that the story you want to tell somebody? But if so, if someone asked you if you had this you have one story to tell, what would it be? I would pay attention to that because that's your inner self telling you what is inside you, and then just take it from there. And then the rest of the process is doable. It's not it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be super fast unless you're extraordinary and potentially very lucky, which is probably closer to the truth. Um, but uh, hey, what isn't? You know, if it's good, what? who cares how long it takes? Yeah. I'll tell you the top three pieces of advice that I give in a generic situation. But honestly, in real life, if when someone asks me and they always do, I, I, I have to find out more and tailor the response to them because there's so many different reasons people don't write. Um, but the first thing I always say is read. And you said that already, Stephanie, but um, Cheryl referred to mentor texts. And really, I personally believe anything can be a mentor text. Sometimes I'm reading a book for adults and there's something about it. You know, the way that the author brought a scene together, the way that a character's backstory was told, it could be anything that speaks to something in my own writing. So number one is read. Number two is get a notebook. I know, Stephanie, you're a huge fan of notebooks. I'm a huge fan of notebooks, too. I have many, many, many notebooks. They're going all the time. I use my notebooks for all different things. But um, I tell everyone, have a notebook. It's just for you. You don't have to show it to anybody. And you don't have to write stories in your notebook. If you want to, great. Um, if you want to jot down ideas, I like to do questions. I like to ask myself questions and then I don't come up with one answer. I try to come up with as many different answers as I can. The question could be anything, could be a very specific question. It could be a generic question, um, but I do my thinking in my notebook and I always have a notebook. And then the third thing that I always say is write what you love because if you are not completely in love with your idea or your story, you will not have, number one, the love to put into it because the love will be on the page. But number two, you won't have the wherewithal to stick with it because the journey can be very long. Even if it's quick, even if you come, it comes together quickly, the whole publishing process and the rewriting process goes on forever, or it seems. So if you love it, you're gonna have that, what you need in order to make it come alive. Oh, such good advice. Read, keep a notebook, think about that one story you might tell, and maybe you jot that down in it and think about something you love. Now, I have to ask you a question about your notebook, because every time someone tells me they notebook, I have to ask, no, is a I special am not. kind, a special I already know what publisher? the question is. You know, nope. know you do. <laughs> nope. I have all different kinds of notebooks. I have different sizes of notebooks. I have spiral bound notebooks. I've got the black and white composition of yep. it. I buy notebooks at the dollar store. I have cute no, but I have all different kinds of notebooks and I am not precious about them. <laughs> I just write anything in whatever notebook I happen to have with me. Yeah. Um, every once in a while, I try to have just one notebook for one thing, like a particular story. And I'm actually doing that right now, only because I just can't find my notes. <laughs> that is a problem when you are a notebook hoarder. That is a problem to find the right notebook at the right time. I know that pain. <laughs> <laughs> So that was advice for someone who's considering, you know, as that dream might be considering to write. I'm going to get really, really selfish right now and ask you a question that I wanted to ask you. Um, and it, 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 it leads into a question and a wish. So my question is in writing Kidlet 101 and 102, it is very much focused on fiction. 
writing for children's literature. But my first draft of my picture book is actually nonfiction. And so what I would love to know, and and I don't know, maybe I'm planting the seed for Kid Lit, you know, 103, hint, mm-hmm. hint. <laughs> Do you yep. have do you have any different advice or any tidbits for someone who wants to write nonfiction, perhaps a, a biography or just, you know, some sort of factual, fun, curious book for kids? Well, let's let's put the disclaimer out there. Neither Cheryl nor I have ever written a nonfiction book except okay. for <laughs> except for for adults. Um, but I will give you some generic information that I would totally feel comfortable sharing in a public sphere like this, which is number one, mentor text. Mm -hmm. You really do need to study what others are doing well. Nonfiction, I will tell you as a reader, is super exciting today. There's so many different, um, in fact, I just posted about this on Twitter, Stephanie. Um, There's so many different creative ways that authors are sharing nonfiction information with readers today. And there's so many innovative formats that didn't exist even 10 years ago. So I would take a look at all of those things. And then the second thing I would say, and this is coming from Cheryl's and my direct experience in having written nonfiction ourselves, and Cheryl alluded to this when she was talking about how we wrote Writing Kidlet 102, which is you really have to think about that reader. Yeah. How is the reader going to access this information? How are they going to be able to, because something might be very clear to you but it's not gonna be grabby for your reader. You've got to hook them. Yeah. And so you've got to figure out, you can learn that from mentor text, but you always have to take yourself out of your own perspective, which is super hard for any human being to do, let alone a writer, um, but you have, to, you have to think from the reader's perspective. Yeah, that is such a good point that I lived because I did write my first draft and I stepped away for, for a couple of days and I came back to it and I realized that, you know, the 40 something year old educator slash college professor slash podcaster wrote this for someone who might be interested. And boy, did I have to remember that I was hopefully writing this for like eight to 12 year olds. So that, that was one of the first set of revisions of, did I really use that word in this book? It's going to know what that word is. So it, it really was hard, even for someone who has children and is around children, when your writing voice is one way, you do, it's really, it is hard to step out of yourself when you're writing. So I just stayed in my lane when I was writing and thought, okay, there's revision. There's revision for that to, to, to make it to the level that I want it. So it is such a good reminder. Yeah, no, that I I would uh, just echo that so much. Um, the world of creative nonfiction and nonfiction for children, there's slightly, I don't know technically whether they differentiate or not, but uh, the idea that you can tell a story that's true to a child, that's basically what we're talking about. And whether it's a, and, and the, I think the operative word here is story. So uh, the advice I would say is that you still have the same obligations to tell a story that entertains. And I don't use the word lightly. I mean, it actually captures the attention. Um, of your reader, of whatever age reader you're directing your your manuscript at, and so um, mentor text for sure. You should you should know everything that's been published in the nonfiction field in your genre, yeah. picture book, middle grade, YA, um, in the last three years. You should have a good handle on it. At a minimum, you should know what books have won nonfiction prizes so that you see the best of the best that has been published in the last three years in your genre. And then you then you look at your crappy first draft and you say, hmm, you know, what can I do to make this better? Not that, you know, not that your idea isn't fantastic, um, but how do I make this accessible to the reader, which is which is just echoing what uh, what you both are saying. But I would I would strongly encourage anyone who's thinking about nonfiction to think about nonfiction, writing nonfiction for kids. Uh, it is a huge part of the publishing field today. It, uh, those books are getting published. It's probably maybe possibly even an easier ent- uh, barrier, you know, lower barrier to entry than um, the than pure fiction in, in, in any of the genres. And it is so important today. It's how, uh, it's how um, like the, 
the industry, but how the collective um, group, you know, people and who are getting the message to kids about mind body, about um, about you know, not just information, but how to handle themselves, emotions. It's a huge field. Uh, so there's lots of opportunity for uh, really interesting, fun books. But at the, don't ever forget that even, no matter what you're doing, you're still telling a story. You need a character. You need a problem. Uh, just a list of facts is not going to do it uh, in today's world. Those old textbooks, even old picture books about, you know, whatever, Rin Tin Tin or whatever, not going to cut it today. Take a look at what's in your library and on your bookshelf, in your store bookshelves uh, to find out how they're presenting interesting information. It's so, such a fun field today. Yeah. And I've got to say that was one of the most fun parts of the process, which was just gathering up as many beautiful nonfiction picture books as I could and just sitting there with them and taking it, notes on them and sticky noting them. And it's amazing yeah. Isn't it? how, what, what ideas you are there are being, uh, you know, conveyed to kids through nonfiction picture books today. It's amazing. Yeah. Just amazing. Well, thank you Science, both. Everything. Yeah, that I, I just got a free coaching session from the best. So I appreciate <laughs> that. I, I couldn't let you go without without asking you that question. So hope I, it helps. Oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I just said hope it helps. <laughs> oh, it definitely did. It definitely did. And I'm I'm just so grateful that you both spent this time with me. I know that you've inspired a lot of people listening. You, you already know that you've inspired me and I have 100% plans to keep following your directions and go from that first draft to, you know, as, as good as it can get. And for those that are interested, who want to grab those books, who want to learn more about both of you, about Write On Productions, where is the best place for them to find you? Well, first of all, I would like to say that we're both cheering you on and we cannot wait. <laughs> Thank you. To see how your journey continues to unfold. So we are always going to be cheering for you. Um, right on Productions is our business name, W-R-I-T-E, on productions.com um, is our website. That's the best place to get information. On our Get Started page, people can sign up for our mailing list. And I know you're on our mailing list, Stephanie. We send out a newsletter once a month and we give out lots of tips, inspiration, and also more importantly, links. You know, we're always looking to share helpful things that are going to inspire people. And then... Um, for everyone who does sign up for our mailing list, they will also automatically get access to our one hour free class, which is offered on demand. And um, anyone who um, enjoys that class has the opportunity to take our second class and our third class, which are all about building skills related to kid lit writing but for like super low prices. So that is kind of the best thing that people can do. Information about the two books is also on that same page on our website. So that's probably the one-stop shop. We do have an Instagram at Write On Productions. And then Cheryl and I each have our own websites and socials. Mine are Victoria J Co. And Co is spelled C-O-E dot com. And my Instagram, my threads, and my Twitter are at Victoria J. Co. Oh, and my YouTube. We we also have a YouTube channel. Right on Productions has a YouTube channel, and um, Victoria J. Co. Books is my YouTube channel. Cheryl, do you want to share yours? Yeah, and uh, just uh, in terms of my uh, social, you can find me. Uh, my website is CherylLawtonMalone.com, and I'm on Twitter at Malone Lawton. I don't know why I did that, uh, but Cheryl Lawton Malone is also my Instagram. So. You can find me there and on Facebook as well under the same name. Great. And I will make sure to put links to all of those places in the show notes, including links to both of your kidlit books, the websites, all of the things so that listeners can just really quickly click and get to you and, and get started. Summer is the perfect time to, you know, read a little bit more, write a little bit more. And hopefully this inspires those who've had that little nudge to just go for it. But thank you. Uh -huh. That, that would make our hearts even happier. I mean, if we could get more people excited to actually dive in and do the work, that's what we're all about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for spending time with us today. And listeners, thank you so much. Whether you're a Get Literate listener or a Kid Lit Love listener, I hope this brings you inspiration for a summer of writing for you. Thanks so much for listening. Thank, thank you, for you, Stephanie.
Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Get Literate Podcast. You'll find links to all the books, resources, and ideas mentioned in the show notes and at alitlife.com. Plus, if you want more, you might like to join my Patreon community. There, you'll find additional inspiration for your reading and writing life, like bonus podcast episodes, bibliotherapy book calendars, monthly book clubs, notebooking challenges, live events, giveaways, and much, much more. It's only $5 a month, and you get instant access to all of the previous content, too. You can learn more at getliterate.co. And one more thing. If you love what you listen to today, please take a moment to rate and review the podcast or take a screenshot of the episode and text it to a friend. This helps the podcast grow and builds our bookish and notebookish community too. Thanks for listening.